so I went down to the pit in this big lecture hall, and he said, I got bad news for you, kid. You're a writer. Well, I'm a Long Island kid. I was born in Brooklyn. Everybody was born in Brooklyn, or some should have been, but I grew up on Long Island. I, my parents were part of the post-war move to suburbia. Uh, went to Catholic school, St. Boniface, through uh, first through eighth grade, and then Sacred Heart Academy in Hempstead. Um, and then I went to SUNY Oswego, and I went there because it was rated the number three party school. I think it was Playboy, and it was I had to go to a state school because I had a region scholarship, and that was the only state school in the top ten. There's always the sense that you're a novice with every novel, because you've never written this novel before. You haven't told this story before. You haven't used this voice before. Um, you don't know the structure at all until you begin writing. So there is always that approach of, um, I don't know how to begin. So with my first book, I had arranged my life. I had just gotten married, and we had pooled our wedding money, and we sort of made a pact that I could pretty much write full time for like six months just to see what happened. So that novel, I really wrote almost as, OK, I've got to write a first novel. What do I know about? Is there anything I know about that I could fill 200 to 300 pages with? Um, and I had, between my undergrad and graduate school, I had worked in the city in New York uh, for a couple of publishers, entry-level things. And one of the publishers I worked for was Vantage Press, which was Vanity Press. Uh, while I was in graduate school, I, uh, to fulfill the requirement of a journalism course, I had done uh, an article, sort of a, researched an article uh, about Vanity Publishing. And so it was, um, well, I think, boy, I know a lot about that. Um, so, okay, that's how it really just started with just digging up whatever, you know, scraping the bottom of the barrel just to get it down. Um, fortunately, I was about maybe 100 pages into that first draft when uh, one of the writers I had studied with at UNH, Mark Smith, a uh, wonderful writer, uh, came down to New York to visit, see how we were doing. And I mentioned that I had finally started a novel, uh, which he had been encouraging me to do. And, um, and he said, well, I'm going to send you to a literary agent who I think you're going to love. She's Saul Bellow's agent, you know, which immediately made my stomach drop, like, well, yeah, right. Um, so uh, I found out later that he wrote uh, Harriet Wasserman a letter and said, you will kiss my feet in Macy's window for the young writer I'm about to send you. I didn't know that. It was some years after that I found out that he wrote that letter. Um, so I dutifully brought 50 pages of this only 100-page novel, in pro first novel in progress, down to Harriet's office on Fifth Avenue. I literally slipped it under the door and ran away. I mean, I was just, you know, oh, she's going to laugh at me. She's going you know, to call up Mark and say, I, I represent Saul Bellow. <laughs> Don't send these things to me. But she called me up the next day and said, how many more pages do you have? And I said, 50 more, that's it. And she said, uh, can you come down? I'd love to meet you. And I went down. And her first question was, do you want to work with a male editor or a female editor? Or does it make any difference to you? And of course, I'm thinking, I don't even care if they're literate. <laughs> you know? I mean, an editor, me, work with an editor. Um, by the end of the week, I had a contract with Jonathan Galassi, who was at Houghton Mifflin at the time. I wasn't really sure what page 102 was going to look like. Um, it was just a wonderful bit of luck and a kind of a convergence of, of good hearts um, and optimistic people in publishing, which um, has, you know, has stayed with me to this day when I hear people say publishers you know, aren't looking and don't care and only want that may be true here and there, but it's... Um, it's, it's a wonderful profession. So that was a very different beginning. Um, that night, which became my second novel, I began this 
dual thing that I do. Um, I started writing what I thought was going to be my second novel, showed it to my editor. Um, uh, he was very pleased with the pages, and I went off and wrote it. Um, and as I was writing, I realized that characters were saying and doing things that I hadn't planned on and that really they weren't really uh, sticking to the, <laughs> to the agenda. Um, so I thought, well, there's something I need to write about. And it's, and it's seeping into this story. And it's about memory. And it's about story. And it's about nostalgia. All things that, sure, I think about, but that's not what this novel, that's going to be my second novel, is at all about. So I thought, I've got to write it out. Um, and as I began to write it, I realized, it's another novel. <laughs> and I still have this one that I haven't finished, and now I've got this completely different one. Um, but it seems to be what I need to write. That night especially had a, had a wonderful reception. Um, and, and I heard myself being referred to as you know the novelist of the suburbs, the new generation of the suburbs, and teenage angst. And I was getting all these interesting offers to write things about teenagers, and teenagers in movies, and uh, teenagers in life and teenagers in literature. Um, uh, so I think probably because of that, um, and again, not in a conscious way, uh, I began writing a novel that was about multi-generations. And I guess my experience, um, being the second generation Irish um, and being the child of uh, two first-generation Irish who were orphaned at an early age um, and not having a very good sense of what that another generation's life had been like, what my grandparents' life had been like. Um, the, the woman who raised my mother, who was my grandmother, um, she had no stories about Ireland. She didn't want to talk about Ireland. Um, you know, it was, she was American. Brooklyn was the geographic heart of my family, uh, not Ireland. So I thought, you know, how, I was thinking about that, the, the value of what is lost, what's not told, what doesn't make it into the stories, or makes it into the story, but the story doesn't get passed on because there's a new generation not listening, you know, not really paying that much attention. Oh, God, here comes that old story again. It's not a very good one. Um, you know, let's turn on the television. So at Weddings and Wakes became then, because of my own background and because I understood something about the details of the lives of first and second generation Irish Americans in Queens and, and Brooklyn, became my first Irish American novel. I had no interest or intention uh, in Irish Americans per se or in the Irish diaspora per se. It was just, it was handy material for me to try to work out, again, that what gets lost, what, it, what happens to the experience that doesn't get passed on, you know? Um, is it, does it have any meaning? Does it have any weight? How do we reconnect, um, or do we need to, with, uh, with ancestors uh, who haven't given us anything in particular um, to hang on to? That was really interesting to me, and, and uh, much more compelling than the details themselves uh, or the specific uh, sociology of the immigrant experience, or in particular, the Irish American experience. But of course, the book came out, and now I've gone from being the, uh, the new voice of, of the suburban teenager to the new voice of Irish America. And one of my older brothers called me when at Weddings and Wakes came out and said, what the hell do you know about <laughs> Irish America? Who ever thought about us being Irish Americans? We never thought of it. Where we grew up, you know, every grandparent had an accent. Some of them were brogues. Polish, German, Russian, Italian. I was probably seven or eight before I realized that you could be a grandparent and not have an accent. Um, but you know, the particularity of, of your heritage was just not a big deal. It was sort of more burdensome. You know? um, and my father, being very um, 
having very little tolerance for people who were more Irish than the Irish. Um, you know, we were Americans and, and we were New Yorkers. Um, and if that place over there, as my grandmother used to indicate, if it had been worth talking about, then we would have stayed. I try not to pay much attention to what's said about my books, but finding myself being categorized as this Irish-American writer, I found myself thinking, but you know, there is an Irish-American character who appears in every Irish-American extended family that I know who did not appear in At Weddings and Wakes, and that is the lovable drunk. That is the, you know, the ultimate Irish-American <laughs> stereotypical character. And I found myself thinking, again, while I'm working on a novel that doesn't have Irish-American <laughs> in it, and does, but I found myself thinking, you know, that would be a challenge to write that guy. Could you write a character who is, to his bones, the stereotype, um, and yet, of course, unique? Indistinctly, as if from the corner of his eye, he saw what Billy's fine dream, Billy's faith, was going to come to. But he also saw in his own, his father's, romantic heart that all its consummation would become a small redemption for them all. Yeah, you know, I think um, the, the, the stereotype of the Irish as the marvelous storyteller, um, I think doesn't trouble me as much as the stereotype as the silent Irishman or woman as someone who's repressed. <laughs> you know? um, I don't think the silent, I mean, you know, when anyone um, who's Irish Catholic says, oh, there were things we didn't talk about in our family, um, you can be pretty sure that you know, sex is what everybody's assuming <laughs> that you're referring to. And they would be right, that's true. Um, but I, I, I worry, you know, that the, that that idea of um, what's not said is becomes a stereotype of they can't talk about that kind of stuff, and I think there's it's quite different, um, and I think there is a it it has more to do with a suspicion of language, and a suspicion that language does diminish uh, the the uniqueness. Um, it does disrupt the deeply spiritual um, that we don't have language for. And I think this is where the church comes in, um, that, that the church, by giving us prayer, by, by, by giving prayers to be said, um, the prayers don't, the words of the prayers don't say it all, um, but there's that sense that I can borrow this language and it speaks to what I feel what I long for, what I hope for, what troubles me at night, what, what lulls me to sleep, um, all those things that were I to give language for them, they would be diminished somewhat. They, they would belong to everyone and in some way undercut that they're mine. Isaac Dennison has a wonderful short story that I use uh, in my teaching quite a bit, just because it's a great story in itself. It's called The Blank Page. Um, but, uh, and it's about storytelling, and it's about what's not said. And the storyteller in her story gives the warning that um, if you are true to the story itself, at the end, the silence will speak. If you haven't been true to the story, then the silence is but silence. Um, and, and I think that's... Uh, and you know, I, I hate to make it ethnic, but I think that there is an ethnic, <laughs> there, there, there is an, a, an ethnic part to it. And that is uh, for a people who are so in love with language, uh, the Irish are also a people who have an awful lot of things they don't speak about. And I think there is that, that suspicion of language that, that to say some things to, diminishes it. You know, to, to put it into too many words diminishes it. Um, so as the storyteller, that, that you know, when, when you're trying to remain authentic, 
and you're trying to remain true to the story, uh, who the people are and what the circumstances of the story are, and, and, and not to be manipulating for some end other than the story itself. Um, I, I think that's, that's when it's not so much a choice that I make as an artist, leave that out, oh, don't put that in, but it's, it's more paying homage to the characters and, and, and trying to, I think, stay true to the story, but, but also to, to be aware of the authentic experience of the characters. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think of myself as a minimalist. I don't think of myself as uh, to some artistic end, purposely withholding. Um, but I think it's, it's more hearing the characters. Um, and, and they don't have words for what they're thinking and feeling. And, and for the most part, they're not the sort of people who are going to go searching for the words. Um, but it's all there. It's in the gesture. Um, it's in what's not said. It's in the silences. It's in, um, it's in that moment after which a character says, you know what, sometimes the less said the better. <laughs> you know? And the story's in the silence after that. Child of my heart. Again, I was working on yet another novel with different set of intentions. And 9-11 and happened. Uh, uh, I was honestly in the middle of a sentence. Um, and so it was a good week or more before I got back to the second half of that sentence. And that's a long time for me to be away from fooling around with the work. Um, and so I sort of sat back. And it wasn't that I didn't remember what the, <laughs> what the end of the sentence should be. And I didn't remember what uh, the intention was. But I, again, I felt drawn to something else. I just I had to write out something, and I, and um, and I had to find out what that was. Uh, so, Child of My Heart really again began with it could be a it could be a fragment, it could be a short story. Um, uh, it's again, it's a voice of someone looking back. Uh, but I very quickly began to realize, and again, I think it had so much to do with what was going on in the world around, um, even though that's the thing that you try to shut out when you're facing the sentences. Um, but I, I think I, I was trying to find a way to illustrate, not define, but just to illustrate the capacity we have to understand tragedy um, and to love life. And I think I probably have only saw this in retrospect, but while I was writing Child of My Heart, in all that aftermath, I was noticing how so many of the photographs of the victims of 9-11 were either Christmas photographs or at the beach. And, and it just amazed me that we, the survivors, if you want to refer to us, can look at those photographs and we can understand the joy Completely, we have, you know, and and yet we also know what was coming for that family, and for, we we hold both those things in our minds, in our emotion. We accept them. We don't even stop and think about them. But we but we can appreciate them both simultaneously, and and thinking about that just sort of amazed me. You know, we all live in that shadow. Um, you know, we can think about it all the time. You know, the Irish do, but you know, that's their problem. <laughs> you know, but you know, you can't. But but, and yet we do. We 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 understand that, even if we're not always talking about it. And and um, I mean, there's a wonderful line from from Yeats that I think probably again percolates up in a lot that I write. That under every dancer, a dead man in his grave. You know. Um, we do both, you know, we dance and we, and we understand that. So Child of My Heart really was sort of a catharsis for me, just, just to try to put that on paper. Again, not to particularly celebrate it, not to make a big point about it, not to, you know, hope for healing for the world, but just to illustrate it in a small way. Balancing life with writing. <laughs> I'm not very well. I don't balance life and writing <laughs> terribly well. I found out very early on, um, way back when uh, I 
was first married and moved to Manhattan, and we pooled our, our wedding money um, and uh, decided that I had time to write that uh, the people around you in my community will never, ever understand what that means. Um, so I would be having my morning to write, and at the time all my friends were off in their beginning their careers, and the phone would ring, um, and I would answer it, and a friend would say, are you busy? And I'd say, well, I'm writing. And they'd say, oh, good, because I have to tell you this. I might as well have said, you know, I'm, in the, you know, I'm, I'm eating bonbons and, and watching soap operas. Go ahead, interrupt me. Um, and all these years later, it's still the same. Um, unless I have found, unless I write as if it were a real job, no one else around you will treat it as if it's a real job. And it doesn't matter how many books you publish or um, how much you would think the world has conveyed to the people who know you, well, this person is actually a writer now. <laughs> um, there's still that sense of, you know, you're making this stuff up. If you stop now, you can go back and you can do it anytime. Do it at night. Do. Um, I do think that popularly, uh, Readers are forgetting uh, that literature is about more than its subject, that, that the subject is just a means to an end. It's the, it's, it's the details um, that are to bring us to another place. Um, and, I, and I think the popular focus on literature is so much what it's about um, that, that often I think we forget that really greater gift that, that a, a wonderful uh, piece of literature gives us. And that's uh, to forget what it's about, to forget what we are about, um, and, and to understand um, you know, those, those things that supersede the detail. The details get us there, sure. We, we want to see a place. We want a good show. We want to, uh, to have that, what John Gardner calls that continuous dream of living. Um, but where, we, where that brings us is so beyond um, a book about a whale, <laughs> you know. Um, and I think in some ways we forget that. I think and it may have to do with how books are promoted. You know, it's hard to say, um, read this book, don't ask what it's about, you know, just, just uh, read it for the existential pleasure, <laughs> you know, rather than, oh, here's a true story about a rape and a murder. Oh, good, I, that, that I'll read. I, I've, I'm so filled with admiration for the real writers in the world and the real writers that I encounter. Um, and maybe that's, my, maybe that's the thing that makes me an Irish writer, this constant humility, um, you know, oh, I'll never be as good and I'll never. But I, I just have, I am so fortunate. And I do think it's good fortune. And maybe that's why I find myself writing about confluences of circumstances that, that result in grace. Um, that's been my career. The boy finished the piece, and in the fading of the last notes came the voices at the front door of the church. The Keens, and he had their names on a slip of paper in his pocket, the other parents, the groom and the young expectant bride. Have you taken a lot of lessons, the priest asked, before he walked down the aisle to greet them? Because it would be an informal wedding, the best kind, really, softly spoken, unrehearsed. Or have you always known how to play? The boy was arranging the pages of his music. He looked over his shoulder at the priest. The lights from the altar cast the shadows of his long lashes across his cheeks. A young man, beautiful in his way. Both, he said politely, a lot of lessons, but it seems I've always known how to play. Monsignor nodded. John Keene in his gray suit was coming toward them from one side of the aisle, favoring that bad leg, his son, his other son, just behind him. And then what had to be the bridegroom, looking like the oversized boy he was in his first suit, well scrubbed, determined, afraid. The women in their pale wedding clothes were gathered at the door. It's a gift then, the priest said.
I think I'm writing about what it is we all long for, what it is that troubles us. Um, the essential question, does love redeem us? Does love conquer death, really? Um, is, that, is that true? And, and how I get there, whether I get there through Irish Americans from Queens or um, Ubangis or um, uh, a Mexican child, um, you know, or someone in the Canadian Rockies. I don't know. So what? Um, you know, how I happen to get there has been through, so far, has been through those kinds of characters. Um, I think the redemption part speaks to that. Um, you know, life is meaningless. Uh, it's very easy to see. Much easier to see that life is meaningless than that it has any meaning. And I guess what, what I'm trying to find out is how can it be enough? For most of us, it becomes enough. Those moments of grace, those moments, you know, we know we're all going to die. We know the people we love are going to die. We know tragedy could be around any corner. Um, we know a hundred years from now we're all gone, um, and and much of what we felt um, will will be obliterated. Um, and yet, how is it that um, that Marx Brothers movie makes us forget all that, and 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 the desert disappears? That's what who gave us that gift? That's wonderful. That's amazing.